Hey, what's up everyone? This is Kyle, also known as Simulation Lab here in Brooklyn, New York. And we're back again with a new tutorial of 3D Studio Max. This one's a crash course on animation, right? And within 3ds Max, you can animate pretty much everything, right? And we'll really get into the weeds of what that really means. Um, but in this crash course, we're going to be covering five methods of animation, right? Um, and we're going to be covering all these different techniques within those five methods that you can use um, at your disposal for when you're creating things. And by watching this tutorial, and you can use it to refer back to, um, you know, you can you can probably animate just about anything after after we cover all of these methods, right? So the five methods we're only covering. The first one is transform-based animation, right? And basically, what that means is like moving stuff around the screen, animating scaling, and just basic stuff like that, rotation and whatever. Um, the second method we're going to be covering is modifier-based animation, right? So you can animate all the parameters of all the modifiers, and you can use the modifiers in ways that you might not think they would be used for, right? Um, it kind of just depends on the effect they're going for. The third method we're going to be covering is animating with constraints. So we're going to be covering the path constraint, uh, the position constraint. We, we touched on uh, the path constraint a little bit in the beginner's crash course um, for 3ds Max. So if you haven't watched that video, it's a couple years old. Um, so I'm, it's, it's due for an update, but still all of the methods stay the same in that video, so it's still relevant. Um, there will be an update to that video uh, coming relatively soon. We'll be doing an, a new crash course based on uh, the uh, newer version of, of uh, 3D Studio Max. So we're still using 2018. Um, we're still going to be using 2018 for the next, for this tutorial and maybe the next couple. Um, I know a lot of people use earlier versions, so I just wanted to keep the sort of middle ground uh, between er really early versions and the newest versions, you know, 2022. So anyway, the, the fourth and fifth methods that we're going to be covering is based on simulation, right? So we're going to be simulating things with mass effects, physics-based simulations, um, and uh, simulating with uh, the, the, the cloth tools that 3ds Max comes, comes with. Um, we won't be covering tie flow, so um, I do have a, you know, the, a separate uh, uh, playlist uh, of all the tie flow tutorials in my channel. So if you're interested in that, like more advanced simulation techniques, I def definitely would recommend uh, checking out some tie flow stuff. It's a, it's a huge, amazing tool set uh, to plug in for Max. And um, we're just going to be, in this crash course, we're just going to be focusing on everything that comes built into 3ds Max. Right? So with those five methods in mind, let's jump right in. So I have a fresh Max scene loaded up here. We'll customize your units, unit setup. Um, we're going to be using the metric system centimeters and uh, system unit setup uh, one unit equals one centimeter. Cool. So I typically like to do that. Sometimes it doesn't really matter. Okay. So in our perspective view, um, we hit Alt W, go into our perspective view. Um, again, if you haven't seen the uh, beginner's crash course guide on 3D Studio Max uh, uh, on my on my the video i'll link it down below i definitely recommend checking out that before jumping into this one um also i do have a crash course on how to model anything like how to 3d model anything um so check that video out too because we're going to be covering some stuff that uh we're going to be going pretty quick here with just modeling stuff uh, so if you're not familiar with like basic modeling features and like how to model stuff in max then i would definitely recommend checking out those videos anyway um so let's create a box Right, so we'll just toss a box in our scene. It doesn't really matter how big it is or what, it, you know. Just, just create one, just put it somewhere. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus down here on this timeline, right? So now we have, you you might have a different number here. This might be different for you. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set our timeline configuration here. So in this little time uh, clock uh, icon down there, you click on that. And uh, in our length or our frame count here, you know, what we'll do is uh, in our length, we'll, we'll set this to be um, 30, right? So we have 30 frames. So now what you should see down here is 30 frames of animation, this little timeline that's down here, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a simple little 
um, animation on this guy, just moving him back and forth, right? So on our timeline, we're gonna drag this out to about 15 seconds. And what we can do is we can turn on this auto key, right? And if you enable auto key, anything you do to the assets in your scene, while auto key is on, while the, you know you see the timeliner down here is, is red and the viewport has a red frame, red frame around it, um, anything you do to your objects here is going to be recorded as a keyframe. So let's say if I just drag this along the X axis, right? Now it creates a keyframe here and a keyframe back here. So now if I scrub the timeline back to the original, you'll notice that it changes, right? It translates. Cool. Um, so now what we can do is we can grab this keyframe. If we hold shift and drag the keyframe, uh, we'll put it, we'll put one at the end, right? So what that's going to do is it's just going to replace, it's going to go back to the original location. So if we turn off auto key, we hit play, we just have a simple transform animation that goes from left to right, right? Now this is going nice and smooth. It's pretty much what we want. But well, let's say if we create a duplicate of this, right? Right? And for this cube, what we're going to do is we're going to open up our curve editor, right? So there's a couple ways you can get to the curve editor. You can right click and you can uh, uh, click on curve editor or you can just click on this little button in the timeline right there. So that's going to open up this curve editor. We're going to be looking at this a couple times during this, during this video. Um, but right now we're just going to really briefly touch on like what some of the stuff is. So what we can do is a uh, click on these two buttons here and sort of like get a, a larger scope, uh, uh, see the, the full sort of curve of this object. So we currently, we know that we're animating the object in the X direction, right? So X is the red arrow, right? And so this translates here where it's uh, the red curve, right? And so what we want to do is we want to keep this one the same. So we'll, we'll keep this one a sort of, um, you see how it's curved like this? Well, we can, we can change that if we want to, right? So we can uh, select these um, little uh, curve editor uh, components right there, you know, little dots, right? And we can choose to modify that. What we can do is we can set the tangents to linear, right? So now it's more of like a, um, a linear pattern where it goes up and down, right? So what does, that, what does that really mean? So if we close the curve editor and we play this, the animations, the top one is going to stop stopped abruptly while the bottom one is going to have that nice smooth curve you see how that looks so you can play with this a little bit and like kind of really understand how, well, how this is looking we can even slow this down if we, a little bit if we want to so we'll slow this down to half speed okay, so maybe it'll help us get a little bit more better understanding of what this is actually doing so the bottom one is still nice and smooth, right? It goes to the end and then it has like a sort of like a, a, not a delay, but it's like nice and smooth, right? And the top one, it stops abruptly, stop, stop, stop. It's like a game of Pong, right? And so that is what, those, this, that kind of general idea is, is things that you can do in the curve editor, right? Is you can edit um, the, uh, values in the curve editor to make it more abrupt or more smooth and you can adjust these and, and get it really and uh, a sort of more refined control over your animation right so that's the first time we're going to look at this um, i just wanted to show you guys what the curve editor is and just give you a little brief uh, intro uh, there so next thing we're going to look at in our sort of transform based uh, animation techniques is just animating simple properties right so let's create like a pyramid and we'll just stick a pyramid in here in our scene. Again, it doesn't really matter how big it is, right? Um, and we'll maybe just move that out of the way of the uh, cubes, put down here. Um, okay, so in our properties here, in the parameters of this, you know, basic object, right, that we just created, um, if we hit on auto key, and we'll scrub to 15 seconds, right? We can animate any one of these properties, right? So we can animate the height. So we'll make the height go up. And you'll notice this black keyframe shows up here. Now black keyframes are up here when you animate properties of objects, right? Um, so what that does is it does exactly what you think it would do, right? So now if you have this little red slider here, that means that property is currently being animated. Right? So we can grab this keyframe, we can drag it over to the end, 
and cool. So now we have this animated pyramid. So that just proves the point that you can literally animate anything with, with the, the time lighter, right? So you can animate properties, you can animate translation, uh, you know, transform um, uh, values um, and anything else. So it's it, that, that in that way is, is super powerful, right? So one more thing we'll look at real quick in, in this uh, in this sort of context, we'll just move this stuff out of the way. Uh, go back here to zero. Uh, we'll look at um, sort of like uh, we'll touch really briefly on procedural animation. What that means is that there's a there's a few sort of like automated ways of animating things in Max. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just show you with an example. We'll drag out a teapot, right? And what we're gonna do is. We'll link the teapot to a sort of dummy object um, and animate the dummy object, right? So in our helpers, we'll create a dummy or, you know, we can create a point. Let's just create a point. So we'll just stick a point somewhere in our scene. And we can put that point anywhere, maybe just, you know, right there or whatever. Um, and what we'll do is we'll uh, select and link, use a select and link tool, and we'll click and drag on the teapot, right? And get this little select and link tool pops up, and we'll just link that to the point. Right. So if you um, if you watch the uh, how to rig anything tutorial, we use you know the sort of select and link tool quite a bit. Um, so you can you know, check that that video out. Um, anyway, so now that anywhere we move that um, point, the teapot's going to follow. Right. So we can move the teapot independently of the point. Right. So now what we can do is we can animate the point moving. Right. So let's say for instance, if we wanted to animate the point moving back and forth. We already know how to do that, right? So we'll just drag out to 15, hit auto key, and move the teapot that way, right? And we can hold shift and drag and just create a duplicate of the first keyframe. So it'll just kind of go back and forth in a smooth motion, right? So a cool thing we can do now is we can affect the teapot and we can animate the teapot. Let's say for instance, if we wanted to have the teapot move like over here or whatever we can we can put in all these different keyframes on the teapot while it's linked to the other to the po to the point as it's moving right so we can go along here and we can go say move the teapot over here we can move the teapot over here right and we can animate it while it's moving right and i know that's not terribly complicated but it's just something that you might not be you might not be aware of right so that's cool one other thing though, is we can automate the movement of the teapot with a noise modifier or something, right? Not with a noise modifier, but uh, with a noise sort of uh, automation, right? So what we can do is um, in our motion tab here, uh, we can click on position and we can click on assign controller and we can do a uh, noise position controller, right? And what that's going to do is, if we scrub this along here, it's going to still move along with the point, right? But it's super jaggy. So what we could do is um, increase the, or decrease the frequency a little bit, and maybe we could turn off fractal noise so it'll be smooth. And uh, we'll take a look at what this is doing. And it's kind of like it has this like sort of fluid motion to it, right? It's but it's noisy, so we can increase the frequency a little bit, right? And it kind of bobs it up and down. It's, it's it's all automated and it loops perfectly, which is great. So what we can do here is we can um, remove the Z strength. We can just set the Z strength to zero, so it'll just have noise in X and Y. So it'll kind of dance around, and we can kind of play this and see how it looks. Okay. So that's pretty cool, right? I mean, like it, uh, it you know, like that's like one way you can automate stuff. Um, it's just like pipe tossing on um, constraints, right? Uh, in the uh, uh, animation controller uh, for this particular object, right? So um, those are like a couple of those very basic um, things that you can animate, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop open my layers panel here, and I'm just going to assign all this stuff to. I have some layers set up already. Um, I have this all set up to sort of like a sliding boxes layer or whatever. Um, the next thing we're going to be looking at is a bouncy box, right? So we'll hide all this stuff and I'll choose on, I'll set on my bouncy box. By the way, I'm, I'm going to be um, cleaning up this uh, file and organizing everything and I'll make the file available 
um, for download. So I'll put a download link in the description. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create a simple bouncing animation, right? And we're gonna do it in a couple different ways. I'll show you a couple different, you know, techniques of how to how to do this. Uh, there's a million ways you can do a bouncing animation, um, but we'll focus on the very basics and maybe we'll do a little bit more advanced one. So uh, we'll start by going under extended primitives and we'll create a chamfer box. And we'll just stick that in our scene like that. And uh, click again and make sure that we have the box created and go under our modified tab and we'll do a little bit of a fillet on the edges just to make it look kind of cool, right? And it could be any size, really. It doesn't really matter. So maybe we could, we'll just do like um, 50 and eh, 30, yeah, 40 <laughs> by um, 60, yeah, by, yeah, like um, 75, right? Cool. So we have our little uh, chamfer box here. And we can add some segments. We can add some width segments and... Uh, Length segments and height segments. We'll, we'll see. Well, I'll show you why this is important later. Um, I'll add a few more. Just let me, give it, let me get a little bit more dense, right? Cool. Um, and now what we could do is, uh, you know what I might do is I might toss on a little material. I have a material created in here, so I have a little face. So we'll slap on a, a face uh, material and put a U, little UVW map on it, fire on it. Um, let's see, UVW map. Set it to planar. You know, kind of just like, oops. Cool. This is just me having fun. <laughs> so now it's kind of like a character, right? <laughs> okay, so first thing we're going to do is we'll click on our character and right click and convert to editable poly. That'll just remove the UVW map modifier. We don't really need to see that anymore. Um, so what we can do is. In our time configuration, we'll set this back to 1x. I previously had it at half x speed, um, so set that back to 1x, right? We'll drag our timeline over to, um, with our, I guess with that, at it with the timeline at zero, we'll just drag up in Z, um, a little character here, and then we'll drag over to 15 frames, turn on auto key, and then we'll right click on our Z transform here. We'll set that back down to zero, right? So that just so the jump cycle will start at zero. He'll be in midair at zero, and then we'll hit the uh, floor at uh, fifteen, right? Cool. Okay, so with that done, um, what we can do is uh, there's a couple things we can do, right? We can grab this last keyframe and hold shift and drag it over. So now we have like a full cycle, right? And around that like twelve minute mark. Or so we could do is uh, hit R or you can use your scale uh, you can click the scale button up here and we can uh, hit set key okay? and then drag over to like 15 seconds or so you know what we'll do is we'll just get rid of this one for now so we can like visualize how this is actually working um, after the 15 second mark after 15 frame mark around 17 frames or so what we could do is we can you know scale scale it to make it look like he's kind of squashing down right so when he hits the ground he kind of squishes right so that's like one this is just one way of doing this right um, and then now to get him back to where he was the basically we could grab this little keyframe we can grab this keyframe here and hold shift and drag it over somewhere here right so he like snaps back a little fast so what we could do is like slow that down a little bit so what this is going to do effectively if we zoom out and play this thing I mean that needs some tweaking right but it, it kind of gets the the general the, the, the general idea is he can like you I mean you can tweak this forever and make this look pretty good but it's it's just, just a standard like really cheap way of making him look like he's like squishing when he hits the ground right so and there's a couple other ways we can do this. So let's let's get rid of these keyframes. You know what we'll do is uh, we'll leave our transform keyframes. So we'll just remove these ones for the scale. So now we just have them going up and down. And so now we can animate uh, our little character squishing by using a modifier. So it's a different, slightly different way of doing this. So 
Um, what we can do is, uh, with our character selected, we can scroll down and uh, put on an FFD 3x3. So this, is this will give us a lattice work of, um, a sort of lattice of control points that we can uh, use to, to manipulate what our character looks like, right? So we can squish them inward and outward and stuff, and we can move these around. So that's that should be pretty cool for what we need. Um, so again, this is just like an another sort of simple way of doing this, but what we can do is, um, with uh, auto key selected, turned on, I mean, so we'll uh, he'll scroll uh, maybe like halfway between um, where he's at the very top of his jump and uh, where he almost hits the ground. We can grab all these control points, maybe scale them inward and stretch them out a little bit as he's falling, right? And so as he's falling, he kind of gets stretched out a little bit, right? And then right, I guess like right after he hits the ground, what we can do is... Um, Maybe like scale them inward a little bit and stretch them out like a little bit like that. And we can grab these and kind of squish them down. Grab these ones, move these down like that, right? And kind of like squish it like that, right? So what that'll effectively do is he's like falling, gets stretched out, and then right when he hits the ground, he gets, gets squished, right? And then we can grab this, uh, I guess we can grab this keyframe, pull this one out here, and then that'll like um, sort of complete the cycle. Like right when he gets squished, he like starts going back upward, right? We can always grab this keyframe and pull this one all the way to the end, right, to complete the cycle. And we'll kind of just see how this plays out. And so that's like a little bit more convincing because that kind of makes him look a little bit more like jelly or rubber or something, you know? So we can even select this we can uh, uh, kind of visualize it a little bit better so I, I like that I mean it that, that looks kind of like a bouncing eraser or bouncing piece of rubber rub, little rubber character or something right so that's kind of convincing so the next thing we can do is we can um, instead of using a um, um, lattice modifier we could let's go ahead and erase these And we'll just uh, set up a new um, new little keyframe here for the beginning, right? And we'll get rid of our FFD. Um, so now we have just the standard animation going up and down. Cool. And so what we can do is we can do like a, I don't know, we can try a melt modifier, right? So now with our melt modifier on, we can just drag over here and then around this point what we want to do is just test and see how this is going to look right so we can do percentage of melt we can do make this jelly right and so we can play with these parameters maybe we want to kind of squish them out a little bit more like that right and so this this is going to make them look like kind of gooey right and um so that this uh, melt amount is what's controlling the melt so if it's at zero there's no melt and if it's at, you know, we can go as far down as we want to, right? So I think about there might be kind of cool, right? And you can maybe spread it out a little bit more or something, right? So that might be pretty cool. So let's let's kind of like see how this how this looks, right? So what we could do is like right at that 12 mark or whatever, we can like maybe set a keyframe right there. All right, but just by like clicking, like going up a couple or just like one or whatever, and just going back down to zero, that'll set a keyframe there, right? So that'll be our baseline. And then right after 15 seconds, right, what we could do is uh, increase this, you know, so you can set a melt amount to like 46 or sorry, seven or so, right? So that'll like squish him right down, right? And then we can set another keyframe here by hitting zero, right? We can like right click on that. And then, of course, we can always grab our last keyframe and we kind of see how this animation plays out, right? So this one's like a little bit more fun and a little bit more dynamic, right? Obviously, we can stretch these out a little bit and make it a little bit better looking. Um, but yeah, so I mean, that's just like a different way of doing that. So that's that's animating modifier parameters um, to get this a sort of similar effect. Now you can always like layer these effects right you can always animate um, multiple modifiers on top of this character and maybe if you did want to use the lattice modifier or if you want to um, animate a scale um, transform right on him as he's coming down here you can toss in like a, another keyframe to animate the scale 
right? And you can you have like full control now of like what this thing's actually looking like, what it's doing. Right? Pretty cool. Okay, so the next method that we're going to be focusing on is animating with constraints, right? Um, so we're going to be taking a look at the path constraint and the position constraint. And for this demonstration, I've modeled this really terrible looking pickup truck with a little dude in it, right? And he's got a little steering wheel, he's cruising around, right? So the idea is here uh, with, with this with this car, um, we're going to animate this car cruising around a track. So we're going to draw on a track, we're going to have it sort of procedurally animating along the track. And then while he's cruising around, um, we will uh, maybe have, um, uh, we'll control his arm, right? He's gonna be waving his, his arm over uh, at traffic and stuff or whatever, um, up in, in an automated way, right? So we're not, we're not, you know, what we could, what we could do, right? Is with his, with his arm moving up and down, we can do auto key, right? And we can like every couple frames or whatever we can do this right, and then so that so we can manually animate this thing right. If we grab all these keyframes and copy them over, and then so like we can make his arm wave like that. That's kind of like um. But what happens if we extend this uh, the animation out right to like five minutes long or something right? Then we have to go back through and copy all these keyframes, and then it's not dynamic, right? What if we wanted to wave really quickly or really slowly, or if we want? What if we want more control over that sort of thing, right? And so, I mean, this is an extremely simple example, but it applies to, to you know, larger scale um, concepts and stuff that you might work on in the future, right? So. Um, just, I want to keep everything as simple as possible in, in these uh, little, you know, technique demonstrations. So with our arm selected, go underneath our curve editor here, um, and we can drag this down and underneath rotation, we have our X and our Y rotation, right? So I think it's our Y rotation. Let's see. Yeah, that's our Y axis. Yeah. So that's what we want to rotate this thing on, I think. So what we'll do is uh, underneath our right, Y rotation down here, we'll right click, do uh, assign controller, and we can assign all different kinds of controllers here. Um, so we'll do a waveform float and see what that looks like. So that'll give us like a sort of sine wave or whatever wave we specify. Um, and so here, um, it uh, what we could do is kind of zoom out so we can see what our Am, uh, sort of amplitude looks like and obviously this is this amplitude is way too much right so we want to we want to bring this down a little bit something more manageable like 10 right and so now if we you know, go ahead and zoom out again here um, so that's looking pretty cool right but it's um, kind of like sticking directly upward right but so we can we can bring that down uh, with our vertical bias so if we click on manual we can uh, you know bring that up or down Right, so maybe we want to go a little bit further down with it. So it starts about there, and uh, something like that might work, right? It's kind of wiggling, so maybe we can do like a period of like 20. Let's see what that looks like. All right. So maybe even 20, like maybe 30. And we can sort of tweak this a little bit further, right? So that's kind of cool zoom out all the way so we can see this thing we can even use our little um, magnifying glass tool and visualize the entire uh, period right of the uh, of the wave so that looks like it might work so let's just uh, let's close this out hit close and we'll just hit play and see what it, see what it looks like right so that's going to cycle like once every I don't know 30 frames or whatever you know so what we could do is, if we go back in there, I'll show you how to open this back up, right? With our arm selected, scroll down, and underneath uh, rotation, you can hit uh, properties. And that'll bring up your little waveform controller again. Um, so what we could do is, uh, we'll stretch this out again, and um, say at a period, maybe we'll just like make that a little bit more frequent. So you kind of, you can wiggle his arm. And all of these properties are, of course, anim you can animate all of these, right? Um, so if we, uh, if we go ahead and hit play now, it's wiggling really fast, right? So what we could do is um, maybe bring that period back to something a little bit more reasonable, you know, something like that. Hit play. 
Okay. That'll work fine for now, I think. And what you could do is to get this looping correctly, um, you know, like you can um, sort of match up the uh, ampli the, the peak and the sort of crest of the amplitude, right? Um, I'm not going to really worry about that, but I just wanted to show you that, you know, you can play with all these different sine waves and stuff, right? Like this goes, bup, 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 right? And this one, you know, is obviously a sine wave. You can do all kinds of different, you know, sawtooth waves and stuff like that if you want to, you know? I don't know. You could play with this uh, forever, right? You know. Uh, anyway, so we'll leave that one as is. Um, so yeah. So now that we have our little dude in his pickup truck waving his arm around, what we can do is uh, um, create a little track for him to, to cruise around on, right? So in our create uh, tab and shapes, do a. I guess we could do a circle, but I guess what even a little bit more fun is just doing a line so we'll do a smooth smooth line right and we can just kind of draw this anywhere just uh, start here and kind of make a little racetrack right make something a little bit blobby you can kind of go back through here and edit this thing it's like spline yep um, and I don't know you can you can control this however you want and make it look cool and um, maybe I'll make mine have like a little bend in it like that all right, whatever. This is it's good enough for now. <laughs> okay, so first things we want to do is um, with the car, um, we want everything to sort of be linked to the car's body. I think you know, we could we could set up a dummy object if we want to, like a point, like we did before um, when we animated the teapot earlier. Um, but for this demonstration, I think we could just like have everything linked to the car body. So what we want to do is go ahead and do that. So um, we'll select and link, uh, link the steering wheel of the body. You could just make all this one object, but the cool thing about linking stuff is that now you can, these wheels are instances of each other, so we can um, apply animation to the wheels if we wanted to. I don't think we're going to get that far into detail with this example, but um, the way that you would animate the wheels now is just you know you can put on like a uh, uh, an animation constraint you know how to do that now right and um, then you can have the wheels turn infinitely right as the car is moving and you can make the wheels rotate right? um, by having having linked the wheels to the to the car like this right? so we want to link the little dude's body to the car and what we can do is link the arms to the dude's body right so now, if we could do, if we wanted to, we could like rotate the little guy around and stuff. If, if you have like a little camera in the car looking at him or something, you can have him doing stuff or whatever, like while he's driving and everything you can set this thing up to be sort of procedural in that way. Right. So now if we move the car, everything should be linked to the car, which it is. Well, that's cool. Okay. And um, with our little track here, we can maybe make this a little slightly lighter color so we can see it all the time. Um, we could add a little bit more interpolation to that track so it's a little bit smoother. You can see it's a little bit jaggy. So what we'll do is uh, an interpolation, we'll increase that uh, a little bit so it's nice and smooth, right? Um, and then now what we could do is uh, we'll just go ahead and grab the car um, under our motion tab, under position, select position, and we can uh, hit assign controller. This is the same way as we did it in the curve editor, right? I mean, you can you can pick a particular. Uh, position axis or something and assign a controller in the curve editor or you could just do it here in the little motion tab right? so it's just multiple ways to access that tool right so uh, with a position selected we'll hit assign controller and we'll do path constraint okay? and path constraint the parameters here um, they prompt you to add a path so we'll click add path and we'll just select our line right and now if we scrub the timeline um, it's going around the path and that's pretty cool but we want it to drive in the direction of a uh, particular axis we want it to drive in the, the car is pointing the way that we modeled it it's pointing in the Y direction um, so we want it to uh, follow it right so we can hit follow right and if we hit follow now what it's gonna do is it's gonna follow the path but it just it's oriented in the wrong axis so what we could do is hit the Y axis right 
And being that our car is modeled facing in the y direction, right? Now the axis is going to be correct. So it's going to look like it's cruising along, right? Cool. Now he's cruising along. He's going pretty, pretty fast. So we can, do, we can just to visualize the the speed, we'll we'll slow it down again for just uh, sake. Now you can see, you know, if you look at his arm, his arms wiggling around, you know, um, and he's he's having a good time driving his little his little truck. Right? So that's cool. Um, another thing we could do is let's say, for instance, if the car was a fighter jet or something, right? Um, you can click on this bank. Um, checkbox here right and the car is going to sort of like follow around curves right and that's like pretty extreme I mean like maybe we could model uh, the path like the road to have like bends in it and stuff and we can make it look like a, a sort of like Formula One racetrack or something you know but in our case he's just kind of cruising around a flat road so we can uncheck bank right you know so that's pretty cool so now that we have that set up um, I don't know we, we can mess around a little bit just a little bit right and uh, we can hold shift and duplicate the path. Um, we can even grab this path and move it upward, right? So just to, you know, let's delete this one. Um, just to make sure the wheels are like touching the ground, which looks like they are. And we can grab a duplicate of our path. I'll just set that to Z. Um, and under rendering, we could just enable uh, in viewport and hit rectangular and we can kind of just like make a little uh, racetrack for him to, to cruise along right so it's like a little road and the great thing about this is that it's you know well i guess we could have made it out an instance but um it's procedural you know right so we can like adjust some of these things you know and it'll adjust the uh um the animation right obviously um this one's gonna have to be adjusted too because we, we didn't make it an instance but you can always go back and do that right uh, yeah so that way um, you know we can always modify the track and it'll always um, update uh, the animation and keep it current right. so now we looked at the path constraint um, we can look at the position constraint really quickly um, so the simplest way to do that um, is we could just like try it out with a camera so if you go under create uh, cameras standard cameras we can just toss in a physical camera in here so I'll just like stick it right here right and maybe I'll just like uh, lift this camera up in Z a little bit um, and then I'll grab our uh, the camera sort of look point right the target um, and we can under motion under position we can click assign controller and we can do a position constraint right and click OK and then this is going to ask for the target, the uh, the target of what this item with the position constraint at it uh, should be locked to, right? So what's the what's the target position? So we go add position, and we can click on our car, right? And wherever our um, uh, axis is, uh, or wherever our like um, you know gizmo is located in our car, the origin of the object, that's where the um, position constraint is going to be linked to so now if we hit play um, no matter where our car goes our camera is going to follow it just because the the um, you know the look point is uh, um, is linked linked to the car now right so what we can do is like in our one of our viewports we can go under left or you know we can go to cameras and uh, choose to look through our our viewport right so now if we hit play so it's always going to be looking at the camera, right? So this is like one kind of like a fun way that you can, you know, use position constraints to not have to, you don't have to add keyframes to the, the movement of particular objects, right? We did very little keyframe animation here. Actually, I think there is zero keyframe animation here. This is all just, you know, procedurally sort of created animation uh, based on some really simple tools that Max has uh, built in. Okay, so the next method we're going to be taking a look at, uh, which is method number four, is uh, simulation with Mass Effects, right? And so, um, so Mass Effects is a sort of built-in physics engine into 3ds Max uh, that you can use to simulate um, like sort of uh, rigid or dynamic um, 
uh, little physics simulations, right? So we'll take a look at in sort of detail what that actually means. Um, with our example, we'll start with uh, a simple little dominoes. Uh, you know, everyone probably knows what dominoes are. You stack them up and you can knock them over and they, you know, they sort of cascade in this like really kind of neat way. Anyway, everyone probably knows what dominoes is. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and create a domino, right? I'll choose my layer. Um, uh, we'll create a domino as a box, right? Keep it really, really simple at first. Um, you know, maybe we'll like uh, make it a bit taller. So yeah, you know, we'll set this to be like, I don't know, 35 by 10 by 50 or something, right? And what we can do is um, we can copy one of these out. So I'll hold shift, drag on the X direction about like that far or so, right? And we'll copy all these as instances, right? So maybe we'll copy like, I don't know, six instances, something like that. Um, and then we'll grab one of these and under our modify panel, we'll drop this down and we'll do uh, mass effects rigid body, right? And so now that we've applied this modifier to one of these dominoes, all of them will have that same um, Mass Effect's rigid body uh, modifier applied to them, right? So we want to make sure that this is set to dynamic, right? So there's a couple different rigid body types. There's dynamic, which is like all the moving stuff. There's kinematic, um, which can be sort of triggered to do something. Um, or it can be part of a simulation, but not actually moving or simulating. And a static is something that you would simulate against, right? Um, so the ground by default is a sort of static rigid body, right, in, in Max, even though it's we don't have anything applied to it. Um, we'll kind of show you what that means in a second, but um, you can apply um, other things in your scene to be static rigid body elements that, let's say for instance, if you wanted the dominoes to knock against something uh, and not go any further, right? You can set up a static. Well, we'll, we'll take a look at that in a minute. Um, so make sure this is set to dy dynamic and under your um, shape type, you can set it to box. You can choose all kinds of different um, shape types. One thing to mention here is that Mass Effect doesn't do concave meshes or like a, it does, but it, it, it's a little tricky. So we'll, we'll, we can take a look at that in a minute as well. Um, yeah, so anyway, so now that we have that set up, what we can do is uh, it, under uh, our toolbar settings here, you get to turn on the Mass Effects toolbar, and I just turned it off. Under your toolbar settings, if you right click and you can do um, Mass Effects toolbar, so you might not have that on by default uh, if you have a fresh install of Max. Um, but anyway, so if we hit play, nothing's gonna happen, right? Um, because we don't have anything to trigger this simulation, right? So if we hit play, um, cool, nothing happens, right? Our timeline is going, but nothing happens. So we can go back. Um, what we can do is like create a, like a little sphere that will knock into the first domino um, uh, and start the sort of chain reaction of events. But we could just do this. Maybe we'll just like you know angle the first domino to kind of start the start the process moving, right? So we'll angle that one a little bit, um, and then now if we hit play, let's see what happens. Cool. So it uh, knocks them all over, right? Um, and we can hit, we can go back, and um, if we scrub, nothing happens because we haven't like really done anything yet. What we have to do is bake out the simulation. So we go um, under our little panel here, right? And we go to the little tools uh, icon. What we can do is uh, we can play the simulation, right? Make sure it's what we want, and then. Um, we can uh, do bake all. So we hit bake all, it's gonna bake all the keyframes into each of the objects, right? And um, I mean, obviously our timeline doesn't extend that far. So if we extend our timeline way out, um, you know, maybe to like 120. Um, we can do unbake all too, right? So that's gonna remove all the animations that uh, Mass Effect specifically has applied to our um, objects, right? So what we could do is, um, if we uh, hit play again, which uh, you can hit play uh, uh, this one, which will um, 
you know, track the, the keyframes there, which is pretty cool, right? And we go back and then we can do bake all again. Awesome. So now we have a fully baked animation and all of our keyframes are applied to each one of these dominoes, right? Um, so that's pretty neat. So now it's no longer simulating, and that's exactly what you would want to do. If you're using Mass Effects, it's exactly what you want uh, to do. We'll set this back to 1. Um, before you go to render this thing out. So before you, if you were to render this out, you would definitely want to bake your keyframes, right? Bake all. Um, you can even choose specific things and bake selected or if you want. Um, but just know that if you, if you want to do this, the right way to do it would be bake all, right? Cool, so that is one example. Um, another example I have here is I, I created this little, uh, um, pop up my layers, um, this little like Rube Goldberg uh, course, right? So I, I made this little uh, course that we can um, maybe drop a ball down this thing and see and see if it could, uh, if we can make it in this little um, box, right? <laughs> so what we could do is, uh, you know, real quick, I'll just model the sphere in here. Just toss one in there like that. I can drag this up above our course there. Right. And we can, on the sphere, we can apply the um, same thing, a mass effects rigid body. And this is going to be dynamic. Right? And then under our shape type, it automatically sets it to convex, but we can just set this to sphere because it's a little bit more optimized. Right? Um, and then on all of these objects, I've already applied a Mass Effect's rigid body, but I set all of them to static. Right? So remember we talked be before about um, rigid body types. So static isn't going to move. That's just going to stay exactly where I put it. See right now, they're, they're, these are just kind of floating there right in space. They're not going to be affected by gravity, but they will be a part of the simulation and they will sort of like deflect the, the ball as it's, as it's, you know, falling and interacting with it, right? So now if we hit play, we can just kind of see how this works. Cool. So that's pretty neat, right? So we can go back um, and we can, uh, we can just bake selected. We can bake the selected keyframes on just the little ball, right? Awesome. So now that we have that done. So you can play with this your heart's content i mean mass effects is really really fun it's very powerful um i would strongly recommend continuously saving your scene um while you're um working especially if you're doing anything with any of the simulation tools that are built into max right mass effects or the um, cloth simulation and stuff like that uh, that, we'll, that we'll look at next um Macs can tend to be very crashy uh, when you're doing things with uh, physics simulations and stuff like that. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so last but not least, we're going to be taking a look at the um, cloth modifier, the cloth uh, simulation tools that Max comes with, right? Um, making cloth simulations is very easy. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll take a look at this and it's, it's very powerful. There's a, there's a ton of stuff you can do. So I'll, I'll go ahead and toss a sphere in our scene and I'll lift it up in the Z so it's kind of floating there. And then on top of the sphere, I'm able to zero this out real quick just for, uh, I don't know why, I just like keeping things a little bit consistent, right? Um, create a plane on top of our sphere. Maybe make it about like that big. We'll zero this out as well and we'll lift this up in the Z. That's probably fine. And what we'll do is add a bunch of segments to this thing. So. Um, you know, like do like that much and yeah, maybe we'll just do like 50 by 50, right? We can color our cloth like uh, blue or something, right? Just so we can see it in comparison to the sphere. And what we can do is on our cloth, right? We could just add a cloth modifier. Cool. Um, and here you can change all the simulation properties. You can do, uh, change the gravity if you want to. Um, you can take a look at these properties and kind of mess with stuff, right? Um, and um, what we really want to focus on is the object properties. So click on object properties. Um, and this pulls up this dialog box here that you can uh, modify some stuff. So now what you can do is like, I, this is our plane. 
So what we could do before we do this, we'll, we'll just name these things certain stuff. Like we could name this um, blanket or something, right? And this will be our, um, we could just leave this as sphere, right? Um, so if we click on our cloth, click on object properties, now we know what the things are in our scene because we labeled them. So our bl a blanket is currently inactive, so we want to set that to be cloth. Um, and we can choose a particular preset, right? So we can do, do like, uh, I don't know, cotton, right? And we can adjust all of these different uh, properties, right? The thickness, um, there's like air resistance, there's dynamic friction and static friction and all that stuff. And there's different stretching properties. You can make a really stretchy cloth if you want. These are just the properties that are set up for like a sort of cotton based cloth, right? Um, yeah. So here we can also add objects. We can add different objects in our scene. So we have our sphere. So we'll click on our sphere and click add. Right. And so um, our sphere is currently inactive. So we have to choose it to be a collision object. So we want the cloth to collide with it. Right. Um, and that's pretty much all we have to do. So we just click OK. Right. And then we can do a uh, click on simulate. And depending on how many polys, how many poly, you know faces, uh, or how dense your mesh is, right? Um, it, this could take a while to simulate, right? So our mesh is is relatively dense, right? We could we could have reduced the the amount of um, you know vertices in, in our cloth, uh, and this would go a whole lot faster, right? Um, so yeah, that's pretty cool. So I mean it, that looks pretty natural, right? For a cotton-based cloth, right? You can tell there's some like um, self collisions happening, um, which we can sort of like, you know, let's go pop this open. Object properties. Um, we can give it a sort of thickness. I don't think I'm going to do that in this video because it does take a whole lot longer to process, but just know that you can play with that kind of thing. Um, the cloth, like my, uh, simulating cloth is, especially with Tyflow, again with Tyflow, right? Um, is so much easier because it's multi-threaded and it's like what I mean by that is it it's uh, you can basically run those kinds of calculations on your GPU right and it's so much more efficient to doing that doing it th that way right because uh, Mass Effects and the sort of cloth uh, simulation tool set here uh, runs on your CPU and it's it's just really uh, sort of expensive to do it that way um, so regardless of all that uh, you can get sort of self collisions working really, really well um, with a tool set like Tyflow. You can still do it here with the cloth modifier, but it's just, just to know, just, just note that it's, um, it is a little bit more tricky um, to get, to get it to, to work exactly like how you want, right? So anyway, so that's our um, blanket, right? And then we could, what we could do is uh, we can sort of do the same thing with a um, keyframe animation. We can create keys. Um, says cannot undo are you sure yep so basically that's just going to bake down our simulation to keyframes right so now we have our little animation here and i would definitely recommend again if you're going to render this thing out i would definitely recommend baking your keyframes before um, you uh, process your animation the reason why is because this is a simulation tool right and every time you run the simulation it could be slightly different now let's say for instance, if you have a 300 frame long animation, uh, it would be like about 10 seconds, right? And then around halfway, your computer crashes, right? Or something, or like if you send this um, file up to a server or something to like a render farm um, and uh, it, it, it crashes for some reason, right? Well, the simulation could be slightly different um, the second time you run the animation and you simulate it and you process the animation. So you might notice uh, some, some weird jumps in your animation. So you don't want that. Um, so always bake down your animation into keyframes and it'll save it in the file. And if your computer crashes for whatever reason while it's processing the animation, while you're you know, processing your rendering of the animation, um, you can always go back and, and resume exactly where you left off. And no matter what, uh, the keyframes are baked. So you could just, no matter what, it's always gonna be exactly where you left off, right? Anyway, so we'll look at one more example for cloth. Um, it's kind of fun. So we'll just go ahead and like create a box here, um, just as a sort of floor plane or whatever, you know. And um, we'll name this like ground. 
and we create another box and we will let's create like a little couch cushion or something right so i'll show you like the sort of the way that you can inflate stuff um so in our box what we could do is create a few segments here you know, i don't want it to be too dense or else it'll take forever to process i just want to show you this so um you know maybe we could do like a 30 by 40 um 10 you know something like that's fine Okay, so now with our little uh, couch cushion created, right? Um, it will lift it up just a little bit so it's not sticking in the floor, right? It's just like a couple centimeters or something. Um, we'll go uh, to our cloth uh, modifier. We'll toss a cloth modifier on this guy. Um, object properties. And you know what, we'll name this pillow. This one's pillow and this one's ground, right? Object properties. Um, we'll add objects and we'll choose our ground, All right? So our ground is going to be the collision object and our pillow um, is going to be a cloth object, of course. Preset, I guess we can set it to cotton, right? It's a slightly heavier fabric, but this should work just fine. And down here you have a pressure setting, right? So pressure is like the amount that you want to inflate something, right? So you can do like, um, I don't know, let's just try like a 30 for now. Right, and we'll just kind of see how this works. Um, but just make sure that ground is collision, and this one's set up, and we'll click OK. And if we scroll down here a little bit, and, um, yeah, uh, we hit simulate. Cool. So we can cancel that, and that looks pretty good, right? So it's inflating it, and this is like a perfect way for you to make um, couch cushions, right? And we can even inflate that even more if we wanted to. So what we can do is um, erase simulation, go back to the first keyframe, we can lift this up just a little bit, maybe I'll give it a little bit of a bounce to it. Um, object properties, pillow, um, and we'll choose this to be like 100, right? So we'll kind of blow it up like a balloon. And we'll hit on simulate. Yep. So that's a very puffy pillow, right? So you can cancel that at any time. We can always like go back through here and kind of like choose a uh, sort of keyframe that you like. And if you really like the way this is looking or whatever, um, you can right click and convert that to an editable poly. Um, you know, there's a couple different things you can do. You can like grab a particular state or whatever um, and, uh, you know, keep the simulation live if you want or something. You know, you can always you know, do whatever you want um, to, to create a, you know the the asset that you're the, the end goal right is the is a sort of pillow so with the cloth tool set it's great because you know now you have the power to create like fabric and cloth and stuff like that like in, in, you know like in, if you're doing an architectural scene and you want to take like a if you model like a t-shirt or like a hoodie or something you can basically convert that to cloth right and then simulate it falling or draping over the edge of a chair or something you know and so, like, you can make your scenes a lot more dynamic by adding these little elements, you know, and they don't really take very much time at all to, to simulate, you know, like, depending on how, you know, dense your, the mesh is, right, for, uh, let's say for a hoodie or something, you might have a slightly higher dense, uh, density in your mesh. It'll take longer to simulate, but at least, you know, you have that tool set and it's really simple to use. You kind of just toss on a modifier, you position it where you want it to drape, you hit simulate and it goes, bleh, you know, it just does it, right? So, um, so yeah, that's, uh, so that's cloth. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, everyone. So if you stuck through the entire crash course on animation, congratulations. Uh, we covered a lot in this video, right? Um, obviously we weren't able to cover every single component of how to animate stuff, but we covered a lot of the basics, right? That was the idea for this crash course to just get you familiar with the general sort of like fundamental methods um, that are used all the time for, for creating animations, right? Um, so uh, these are methods that I use all the time that I constantly refer to, and I, it's great to see them all sort of, you know, put together in one uh, larger tutorial. I know this is about almost an hour long. Um, so thank you guys so much for watching. If you like the tutorial, please hit the like button. Leave a comment down below, of course, for the YouTube algorithm, right? 
Um, let me know what you thought of this tutorial. Um, of course, if you guys have any suggestions on future tutorials, uh, let me know. I'm looking, to, looking forward to um, uh, making some more uh, this year. Um, got a brand new microphone, so um, looking forward to producing some better, more high quality content for you guys, right? Um, anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. Talk to you soon. Bye.